So you need to find the, the antiderivative of uh, this and of that. What's the antiderivative of 3x to the 1 half? Then I need to use a little bit of substitution. Uh, that be... Mm -hmm. What is that? I think I have 2x to the 3 over 2. 2x to the 3 over 2? Yeah. One, 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 one. No. no. Oh, yes, yeah. Because the whole yeah, thing is 3 and a half. half. Three, yeah, three, yeah. It's not just x, this is the one half, one half hour, and that's going to be a coefficient of 3. 3 is also being x to the one half hour. So we treat this as a function, within a function, and then we use some substitution. And let's just start here. 
Remember, like the, the function that we find, if we were to take the derivative of it, we would need the chain rule over here. Yeah. So let's make sure when we use the chain rule, we get back to this function. We start at 3x to the 3 halves. What is that? Mm -hmm. 3 to the 3 halves. Well, first of all, we would multiply by 3 halves and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So the exponent's good. But also out in front here, you want there to be like a 1. So what are we going to put here? Okay, so we're going to multiply by 3 halves up here. We're going to subtract 1 from the exponent. That's looking good, except for when we use the chain rule, what would we do next? By what? The derivative of the inside, which would be 3. So next we're going to multiply by 3. Okay? So that's going to leave it, it's going to leave a 3 out. We're going to have 3 times 3x to the 1 half as the derivative. What are we going to do so that like, when we multiply by 3, it also gets canceled out, so that thing is left outside. 1 third, also multiply by 1 third. So we're looking at 2 ninths. This is simple enough, these functions are simple enough that this may be a question on the AP test that doesn't allow you to use the calculator. You can find it if you have time every now and then to appreciate what we were able to do. Find the exact area between these two functions. Can you imagine trying to actually find that with, with any knowledge of the calculus prior to calculus? It's impossible. So all the stuff that we learned allows us to do some pretty cool things. Um, 7.25, any other questions? Thank you. 
14. To do the respect to Y thing, let's look at 13, because it's actually a lot easier to do with respect to Y. So X equals 4 minus Y squared, X equals Y minus 2. See why it's easier, let's talk about it. Now obviously these are functions of Y, right? It's X equals something of Y rather than Y equals something of X. Right? It's much easier to look at those functions that way. Imagine if we were going to do it with respect to x, like we usually do. Um, and we want to find the area between these two guys. We're going to have to do a lot of stuff. For one thing, this isn't a function of, of x. Right? Functions are going to have one output for the input. This clearly has two outputs for lots of almost all of its inputs. The only input that doesn't have, one, that doesn't have two outputs is this guy. Right? Okay, so we would have to break it up. We would have to treat this like a function and this like another function. Okay. Uh, we would do that by solving for y. That would be in this case right here. So we would solve for y. It would look like this. We get y squared equals 4 minus x. And then y equals plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x. So this, so the positive square root of 4 minus x would be that guy. And the negative square root of 4 minus x would be so we treat this like the top function, this like the bottom function, and we then would have to figure out where, well, that's not the This is x. Obviously, x is going to be So then we'd have to uh, do this integral from 0 to whatever that is, that x value, treating this like the top function, this like the bottom function. And then, we have to come over here, find where that intersection is, take the definite integral from here to 0, treating like this this like the top function, and this negative square root like the bottom function. Okay, so lots of stuff is involved. We solve for y in both cases, uh, which in this case is really easy. In this case, we get these two functions, and that's kind of tricky. Um, and it just seems so complicated. Right? But if we look at it as functions of y, then really do it's kind of like tilt our heads to the side. We see like, if we orient our heads that way, and this is a top function, right? Let's turn our heads that way. So that is, this function is greater, right? These are positive x values. So this function is greater over there, and it's you know this function is the lesser function below that function. If you think of this as the top and this is the bottom, right? Okay. So. We still want to integrate on the y-axis from the least value to the greater value. Okay. So we actually would go from the, from the bottom to the top, okay. and then the greater function would be the one that's to the right, or less function would be the one that's to the left. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Would you technically be able to come the other way too? How do you mean? I mean, like, you said if you look this way, yeah. you have curves on the top, but if you look this way, the line's on the top. Yes. But what do we mean by on the top? When we talk about a function of being like this positive here, I guess it'd be the same either way. This one, what is, why do we say this one's the greater one? I mean, if we, if we turned upside down, then this would be the greater one, right? This would be on top of the upside down. Why don't we turn upside down? Because the bottom Like, because we stand here vertical all the time, these things are bigger and these things are smaller. While in the horizontal direction, the x direction, these things on the right are greater and these things on the left are less. Okay. So if we, if we turn our heads this way, we say, oh, this one is above this one. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's the value of the function that we care about. Okay. And positive areas would be over here, and negative areas would be over here. So forget all that. Let's treat it as a function of y rather than a function of x. And just integrate, keep it in mind, like the lower limit is going to be the smaller y value, the upper limit of integration is going to be the greater y value. 
greater function is the one that's farther to the right, and the lesser function is the one that's further to the left. And there's no, there's no need to find intersection points and break it up into several different integrals because this function is always greater than this function when you're thinking of it as a function of y. So, the points integrate, and instead of these being x values, they're going to be y values. Right? From the lesser y value, this one, to that one. So I'm going to figure out where those two points are. So we're saying the x value, what the x value come up to be the same if you got what y value is positive. So 4 minus y squared is y minus 2. y squared plus y um, minus 6 equals 0. Factor it. y plus 3 minus 2. 0. y equals negative 3, y equals 2, after you write an intersection point, right? Mm -hmm. At negative 3, negative 3, negative 3. So where's our integral going to go from and to negative 3? Negative 3 is good. Okay. See how this is actually the same, same, same yeah. as, the, as the other way, except for it. It's so good. Um, okay, so the integral from negative 3 to 2 of uh, what? Which function comes first and which one is subtracted? This top function is first? Yeah. Uh, so this top function is 4 minus y squared. That's the one that's always the right, always the greater value. The value is the x value. Minus or minus. I'm sure you just that negative the whole function. Uh, so let's combine the term. Y squared minus y. So the answer derivative of negative y squared. So now to do this with respect to y becomes as complicated as doing that one with respect to x. With respect to y, we have to uh, break these up into different functions, and yeah, it's going to be a big pain. What you want to think about is sometimes it would be easier to just solve for y, or so, sorry, solve for x, in some functions of y, 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 whatever, equal x. Uh, and then you know, treat the y axis and the x axis rather than try to break it up at the intersection place. Does that make sense? So if you were to be looking at these two functions here, just treat it like normal, like, like we talked about, just uh, find these two points, integrate from here to here, that function like that function. But if you're looking at this one, you're going to want to reorient yourself so that you're looking at functions of y so that you can x and integrate on the y-axis rather than on the x-axis. That, because it takes so much explanation and it's another thing that uh, you know, it takes to get used to, um, we do talk about it, but it may come up on the AP test one or two questions. So, it's something that you're going to want to be ready for, but you know, not before you're really good at the changing or really uh, well versed in related rates. And those are a higher priority because they come up more. This kind of a problem where you 
any great respect to why uh, it's so strong in all of those other areas, and you know, put that in your as well. Okay. Uh, any more questions? So we want to find the area between these two curves. You see that they intersect, which means uh, we can treat this area and this area as different areas. Okay, where from here to here, which looks like it's one, we need to make sure of that. Um, so from here to here, we can treat like one kind of an area, which is the greater function, and from here to here, we can treat it like this is the greater function. It looks like that's one. Let's make sure that's one. How are we going to verify that that is one? That be one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two functions equal to each other. So negative x squared plus x plus 2 equals 2x. Two okay, so I'm going to go inside 0 and the other. x squared plus x uh, minus 2 equals 0. Now that we know that, how do we proceed? which means we can find a common denominator of 6, mm -hmm. right? So negative 2 sixths plus 3 sixths. So that's 1 sixth. One sixth. What? Because yeah, we put a 1 in there. Yeah. Oh, it should be minus 1 out of Minus 1 out. Okay, so negative 2 sixths minus 3 sixths negative 5 sixths, right? Negative 5 sixths plus 2, which is 12 sixths. So negative 5 sixths. this area and how do we do that? Two X. 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 Two
actually have to plug in two and one to find that. That's the first. So when you plug in two, you get uh, eight over three. Eight thirds. Plug in two there, you get four over two, so that's two. Uh, two there, you get two times two. That's F of B minus F of A. So one third. One third. Plus one half. Minus two. Um, <coughs> two and eight times the number. Seven over six is this. Right, it's that area. We found the seven six here, the eleven six here added together. That's fine. Taking a look at it. Thank you. 
where that's two. From zero to well, actually, we don't need to remember these two things. Right? All I need you to do is be able to imagine what it would look like if the cross sections were cut first of all perpendicular, the cross sections are perpendicular to the x axis. I look at this, the graph of this function and I cut them this way, and I look at the thing it needs to look like. Let's say I start using a square. Come up the equation for the cross section, the area of the cross section, the area of the square that you would see. And again, this is for any square. It's like an equation that can plug x into any x. And that's how we start to say the square of that x. Um, so I think what is most helpful is imagining kind of what the graph looks like, which if you have your calculators to use, would be a nice thing to use. If you don't, this is a fairly simple function. You should be able to imagine what it looks like. Okay, it's a, Parabola that is not as steep as your, your standard x squared parabola. It's up to on the y axis, so it's something like this. Okay. And if I want to find the, the area of any cross section, then I need to be able to take this, see if I can rotate it, and then So now kind of imagine that it's, it's, it's laid down on a flat surface. Does that work? Does that look kind of laid down? Yeah. Huh? Kind of? Yeah. I, I really want to, <laughs> well, no matter what I do, that's a nice degree. Well, anyway, um, so a, a, a solid, I guess from zero to truth, so uh, on this side we need to see a square, when we cut it, we need to see a bit of a cross section, uh, here we need to see a square, so that's going to look like this, and here we need to see a square, that's going to be a bigger square, and this is going to be a very good So we're going to have some kind of shape like this. That really helped me. <laughs> that really helped me visualize. <laughs> what that was. Sure. Did it or? Huh? Did it help you? Seriously. Yeah. Honestly. That is quite the drama. I don't you're doing at first, but then. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, right. I, I find it helpful to, to imagine several cross sections and then just kind of they get all bleed together and I can kind of see where it's going. The most helpful thing is to be able to say, look, I got this shape and when I cut it like this, it's going to be a square. So how do I find the area of any square along that region? And the area of any square, you just take the side and multiply it by itself. You take the side squared. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I want to mix myself up, I might say, well, how do I figure out how tall that square is? That's how much you can figure out if you're thinking how tall of that square. But this side of the square is the same as this side. Now, can you find the side, this side of the square? Yeah. Yeah, what is that? Yeah. So it's the y value, right? Yeah. And y equals one half x squared plus 2. So the area of any square along that, that interval is so 1 half x squared plus 2. That's the side. We're going to square that. We were able to find an equation that tells us the area, the uh, surface area of any cross section, any x value. If I put in one, then I'll put one in there, square that whole thing, that'll give you the area of that square. If I'm at two, I'll put in two for x, 
When I do that, it'll give you the length of the side, and when I spare it, it'll give you the area of that cross section. Okay? How solid is this from 0 to 5? How, how much sense do you have? 5. 5? Can I see it? Can we pull up the number? <laughs> 5? Okay, that's good. That's very good. Right now. Okay, so now what we ultimately what we want to do is be able to find the volume of this shape. Really, practically, that comes down to your ability to write an equation for the surface. Okay? Believe it or not. Um, let me show you really quickly. want you to understand it. So, the approach for finding the volume of this shape is the same as finding the area of, you know, under a curve. What do we do to find the area under the curve? We broke it up into little sections, little rectangles, like infinite numbers of uh, infinitely thin rectangles. So now we're going to do the same thing here, but they're like 3D rectangles. So we're going to break it up into an infinite number of shapes that have this cross section. In this case, it's a, this, this uh, cross section is a square. So it looks like this. Each little thing, each very, very thin shape, looks like this. Okay. Let's see. It, it's going to be like a, like the edge of this is going to be straight, so it's not going to follow that curve. But when we make enough of them, and they're very, very thin, then if you take that to infinity, then it will be. You know, it'll, it'll take that, that curve. So go straight back here. So in this case, each little thing, each little shape is like a little box, right? Like a, like the shape of a particle box, a very thin particle box. And a box is a very easy thing to find a volume of, right? We'll take, really essentially, when we say length times width times height, or whichever one of those you want to call length, width, and height, you just take the three dimensions and multiply them together, right? Or any shape that is a, uh, is a prism, which is one side and the other side is identical, and you just, like, all the space in between is just a straight shot. You know what I'm saying? Right? Any, any prism, like this one is it's called a rectangular prism, looks like this, this end looks the same as the other end, and we just go straight back like that. It's called extruded. Okay? We take this shape, you extrude it along a straight path, that <coughs> prism. Um, a rectangular prism. Uh, we could have another shape. This, this cylinder is similar to this. Oh, that makes a little bit of a um, Triangle. Okay. This side looks identical to this side. It's extruded along a straight path. Okay. With this one, we take, let's say, the uh, width, length, and height, and multiply them together. Okay, so here's the cool thing. If we take the height times the width, what do we get? The area. Area. This area, we just multiply it by the length, mm -hmm. right? Imagine what, whatever that area is, then you just multiply it by whatever the length is. If you imagine that, like in a, in a 3D uh, animation, making all of the blocks that make up the volume of the shape, right? Mm -hmm. You do the same as me, imagine the area as squared, and the volume as cubed. So we take that area, which is a bunch of squares, and we extrude it along a straight path, which is, you know, a set of the units. Then, as we move this shape along here, we get we make up all those cubes. If you have any cubes that we take to fill up that space, which is how we find volume. Okay. Well, the same is true of any shape that's like that. You take the surface area, still made of the squares, you multiply it by the length, you found the volume. You take the area. Of, this, of, of one side, multiply it by the length, and you have the volume. Okay? And the length will be basically the same as you had before, right? Like the uh, B minus the length of the Yeah, it will be that. But we won't do all that. That's like the long way to limit approach. We'll just use interface. Okay? 
So you're, you're right. So this is going to look like uh, the surface area. Just figure out an equation. That's why I'm having to do this. Kind of coming a long way around. Find the, the equation for the surface area of one side, and then multiply it by this, this length, right? Or, well, whatever you may call it, a width, because it's whatever you may call it. This guy right here is what we come to a section that we refer to as the x. A tiny, tiny change in x from one side of the thing to the other side of the thing, from the left side of the thing to the right side of the thing. Okay. So that the area of anything of any of these cross sections is given by this. Okay. If we break it down into these little shapes, these tiny, tiny, thin, I guess like kind of thin, 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 thin shapes, then the volume of any of these will look like this. We'll take the surface area and multiply it by the x. Take all those volumes of all those very, very thin shapes and add them all together. Okay? If you remember, that's the exact kind of process that led us to the definition. Mm -hmm. okay? So, just as we did with the area, now we take the definite integral of this function right here. From, in this case, 0 to 3. Okay. So the volume of that shape. The definite integral from 0, 3, 1 half x squared, plus 2 squared. Yes. Take that out. You got the volume of that shape. And because we're going to use the same approach for any solid that has, a, the thing about these solids is that they have a, a prescribed shape of the, of the cross section. The cross sections are going to look like squares, or they might look like circles, or they might look like triangles, or they might they could look like anything. And if we had a way for finding the, the area of that cross section, all we have to do is take the area times dx, take the vector integral from whatever to whatever, whatever we describe to it. And there you go. We're going to start with the general, this is what the cross section is, and then we're going to work, work into something called uh, the, the volume of the rotated side. So they'll have a circular cross shape or cross section, but we'll have to think about this just a little bit differently. Okay. So let's just go on to uh, another example and if we can evaluate this definite integral, we have the volume of it. That's true. Okay? Whether you want to square this out, or you want to treat it like uh, something you need to use some substitution on, or whatever. Okay? I, I would actually, for this, I would definitely multiply this one out. Yeah? So those bottom three shapes, mm -hmm. like you're saying, you just take the surface area mm -hmm. and you multiply it by the width. How is that? Different from like the one shape we're working with. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have like the set surface area the whole way through. Mm -hmm. Is there something different that you have to do? Or is it all kind of No, because the, the, the reason why this is that useful is because um, the the tiny thin shapes, they're like this. The, the, the bigger shape, this guy right here, is not like this. Okay. It's these little shapes. It's what we're using is the fact that all we have to do is find the surface area which is all of this stuff. Find a way to figure out the surface area, and all you have to do is multiply it by the tiny, tiny, width, or whatever you want to call that, that we call the x. When we write it this way, it looks very familiar, but it's like the integral of the definite integral. You put that guy in the definite integral from whatever, depending on what they're asking about, uh, and without it, whatever. Definite integral would have the volume. You need to figure out a way to find the, the surface area of the described cross section. And pretty much just put it in the definite interval from the one, the, the, the lower limit to the upper limit. Yeah. Throw a dx on there because it's really representing the, the tiny, tiny width of each of these little prisms. And you got something you can evaluate to find the volume of these mm -hmm. sphere shapes. Okay. Um, Y equals the sine of x from 
from 0 to pi. And the cross sections will be Now I realize I can make this a lot easier on you by drawing this shape out for you, but that's part of the thing. You've got to figure that out. So work on that for a couple minutes. If we were to you know, take the graph and then just kind of lay it down, or maybe not do that, maybe just draw what this graph looks like. Mm -hmm. Zero to five. Can you draw a graph and then bring it down? I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll, I'll try to think of that part. You just draw the graph normal and not good. That kind of looks like it's going on a, on a, on a table or something. Uh, someone just come up and draw like a, like a cross section on this graph or something? Yeah, come on. That semicircle is standing up off of the, the surface of this thing. Okay. Do we pull that? Do we right. so this is the this is standing straight up. This is lying flat here, and this is standing perpendicular up off of like the table that this is wrapped on. Right? So you need to find the area of this cross section of the semicircle. That's the first thing that we need to do. Uh, how do we find the area of a semicircle? Well, one half is a number, right? So, like, we don't need to, it doesn't have to be really anything to, to draw for this function. So one half, pi is a number as well. R is the thing that's defined by the function. So how are we going to find how big R is? R is too wide? I mean, um, R is the sine of X. Is what? The sine of X. R is the sine of X? The sine of X, the sine of X is yeah. from there to there. That's the diameter. Yeah. So we want to say half, half of that Y value. R, and so R is the sine of x over 2. And we're going to square that. Everybody good? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> okay. So this is the equation for finding the area of any cross section wherever I go, here, 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 and here. I plug that x value into here. It's going to find the y value, the sine of x. It's going to cut it in half, that's the radius. You're going to square it, multiply it by 1 half pi to have the area. Remember what I said before? To, to find the volume of any of these things, or to, to yeah, of, of any of these things, which means what I'm talking about is this shape 
that we just kind of get a little bit of that with whatever you want to think of it as, a little bit of dimension, a third dimension to that shape. It's a half circle on this side, half circle on this side, and a little bit of volume to it. So I want to straighten that. Uh, so the volume of any of those, well, we've got the area, and we're just going to multiply it by that little bit of depth over the outer of the area. So the volume anywhere along the way is going to be the area of the cross section times the a little bit of depth to make the shape out. Yeah, very, very tiny delta. And for all these situations, if you can find a way to find the, the area of the, uh, the cross-section, then all you have to do in order to find the, the volume would be, this is generally, this is your equation for the surface area. There's dx, acts just like a dx in any definite interval that it really represents the tiny, tiny bit of depth because the field shape down. So this one, we're going to go from 0 to pi of our area function times dx, our area function is this guy right here. This is the area function times this constant thing we pull outside of the definite interval, right? Let's look at all of the, the, the constants. We got the 1 half, we got the pi. We also could square this, and we'll have 1 fourth times sine squared x. Does that make sense? We square this fraction, we get sine squared over 4, so we split apart. And so what we pull outside of the definite integral is 1 eighth times pi. Um, the stuff that's left over is sine squared d, sine squared x. Take the antiderivative of sine squared. Try to use substitution, use substitution except for we need a cosine in there for the DX part. Um, mm -hmm. Could we like change it to time square to instead of here like time square D and then like cosine D, 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 D
times one half because we take the derivative of sine and then one by two and then one by two. Uh, um, yeah. I don't know that. Was one half. Now we need to develop these, these two methods called the fifth method and the washer method. So rotate the So if this one is, is slightly different, it's not where we just say, oh, the cross sections are triangles or squares or whatever. Uh, these are the most common type of solid you're going to encounter. So to show you in general what it looks like, so let's imagine we have this function of this, this region right here, and we're going to find the volume of the rotated solid. Typically, we're going to rotate this thing around the x-axis. Okay. So we're going to take this shape and rotate it around the x-axis. Okay. If you're having trouble imagining that, we're going to rotate this thing around this circle. We can actually get that up in the kind of like a boss. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. Yeah. Here, take this. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. We rotated it around that circle. We made that kind of shape. So, what do the cross sections look like? How do you find the area of any of these cross sections? R squared. What is R in this case? Uh, y. Whatever that Y value is. So I, I didn't give you an equation for it, but if you had an equation, that would be the R. Right? If you take pi R squared times dx, right? that would be find the volume of one of those little, what we call disks. Um, and the R would just be the height of the function, whatever that is defined by. Um, one more dish. Let me just take the So, this guy here is R, which is the same as whatever happens. 
is. So infinity of f of x squared. Yes. Uh, a rotated solid. If we rotate things, right, they're going to have a circular path. So yeah, they're all they're all going to have circles. But the differences are going to be like this is your most basic rotated solid where you rotate around the x-axis and the area touches the x-axis. A lot of things where we have the region between two rotated on the x-axis, where we have other axes other than the x-axis. Why are okay. we squaring f of x? Yeah, it's just a ring. Because f of x is r. The volume of any of these is going to be pi r squared. So we're oh. pi yes. e to the f then? So r is f of x, so this should be pi. Okay. Pi r squared. Okay. No, we'll save it.